In the last section of this unit, we're going to talk about periodicity, which are regular variations in the properties of the elements that are sort of modeled on the periodic table. The structure of the periodic table really reveals periodic trends to us. And the first thing to note is that the chemical elements do display periodicity. Elements in the same group, the same column of the periodic table, have a number of similar properties, particularly related to how they bond and what types of compounds they form. We also observe regular variations in properties across periods from left to right. So there may be a consistent increase in the value of a property or a consistent decrease. The same is true moving down a group. We may observe a consistent decrease or increase in a property as we move down a group. These consistent variations are known as periodic trends, and we tend to think about them, as I alluded to, as involving movements from left to right across the periodic table or top to bottom down a group. And what these periodic trends allow us to do are pr to predict the relative properties of two elements based on their positions on the periodic table, and that's highly useful because we can draw analogies and extend our knowledge using the periodic table. For example, we can take knowledge of oxygen and apply it to sulfur using periodic trends to understand the ways in which sulfur will differ systematically from oxygen, and the same is true for other pairs of elements in a common group or period on the periodic table. So we'll look at a number of periodic trends here in various properties over this video in the next, trying to understand the origin of periodic trends in addition to being able to apply them. And their origins, as we'll see, lie in atomic and electronic structure. There's one foundational concept that we're going to land on that can explain essentially all of the periodic trends that we'll see in this course. The first property we're going to look at is atomic radius, and of course this is a measure of the size of the atom. One way we can measure atomic radius is to look at the bond length in a homonuclear diatomic molecule, a molecule containing two atoms, each of which are the same, and essentially divide that bond length in two. So for example, we can look at F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2, take that bond length, divide it in two. That's a measure of what we call the covalent radius, the radius of the atom in a typical covalent bond with itself. What we see if we look at the halogens, group 17, is that atomic radius increases as we move down the group from fluorine to iodine. And this is a general trend. Atomic radius increases down a group. This is our first periodic trend. The reason for this is quite simple. The N value for the valence shell increases. So essentially, the onion has more layers. The building has more floors. And so the building is bigger, the atom is bigger. Now, interestingly, and this isn't shown on the slide, but we'll see it on the next slide, atomic radius decreases moving left to right across a period. And this may seem odd as we're adding electrons to the atom as we move from, for example, boron to carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine. So it seems like the atomic size should increase as we add electrons, but it doesn't. And we will have a good reason for this and a foundational key concept to explain this here very shortly. Here's a graph that shows you the periodic trends in atomic radius. And we can look at specific points on the graph to elucidate the trends moving down a group and across a period. So let's lo look at the group trend first. And for that, we can zero in on lithium, sodium, and potassium right here. We're comparing group elements that are in the same group within different periods. So period two, period three, period four, for example. And what we can see is that the atomic radius clearly increases as we move down that group. And that's true for other pairs or other sets of corresponding elements in a common group. We can see that corresponding elements increase in atomic radius as we move down due to that increasing value of N for the valence shell, more layers to the un. Within a period, we also see a consistent trend. And here, this is highlighted in purple. Atomic radius decreases as we move left to right across a period. So period one, even for hydrogen and helium, the trend holds. Period two, starting with lithium and moving across to neon, that radius decreases. And that same trend is observed across each period. Now, the transition elements are worth commenting on because they're a little bit... Um, 
rebellious in some ways when it comes to periodic trends. They don't always display the periodic trends consistently. And we're seeing that here as there's a slight uptick in radius at the end of the transition series. So generally speaking, if we want to apply periodic trends consistently, we look only at the main group elements. If you focus only on the black, blue, and purple dots here, we'll see that the trend is very, very consistent. And this is true for a number of elemental atomic properties. So this is atomic radius. And what really remains is to explain this decreasing trend in atomic radius as we move left to right across a period. What's going on there? Let's take a look. We mentioned earlier that as we move left to right across a period, we're adding electrons to the atom. But we're also adding protons, and those added protons have the very important effect of increasing the attraction of all of the electrons in the atom to the nucleus. That is essentially the origin of the decrease in atomic size. As we add protons to the nucleus, the nuclear charge felt by all the electrons goes up. There's stronger attraction of the electrons to the nucleus, and all of the orbitals and all of the electrons essentially shrink. However, there's a caveat to this simple idea. And the caveat is that new electrons that are added to the valence shell don't feel the full impact of the nuclear charge. Because those valence electrons between them and the positively charged nucleus are multiple layers in many cases of core electrons that repel the valence electrons. For that reason, the valence electrons don't feel the full nuclear charge. They feel a smaller amount of charge that we call the effective nuclear charge, or Z effective. Z effective is a balance of the nuclear charge Z and repulsion of the core electrons with the valence electrons, which of course decreases that magnitude of positive attractive charge felt by the valence electrons. So a simple formula for Z effective is the nuclear charge, the full nuclear charge, minus S, which reflects the repulsion of the core electrons and valence electrons, an idea called shielding. In some sense, the core electrons shield the valence electrons from the attraction of the positively charged nucleus. Imagine you're at a concert or at a sporting event and you're sitting in the nosebleed seats. To some extent, all of the people between you and where the action is happening provide a sort of shield to your enjoyment, right? We get the feeling that we'd be enjoying the concert a lot more if we were in the first and second row as opposed to the nosebleed seats. This is also how the valence electrons in an atom feel. They are shielded by the core electrons to some extent, and they're not as happy as they would be in the absence of those core electrons due to electron-electron repulsion sort of getting in the way of attraction. So these repulsions are the key idea behind shielding, and we can model that in a very rough mathematical way using this idea of Z effective is equal to Z minus S, a shielding constant. And there are ways to calculate S, specifically Slater's rules, which we won't get into here, but Slater's rules are a kind of empirical model for calculating S based on the number of valence electrons, which do provide a little bit of shielding themselves. The valence electrons do actually shield each other to a small degree. And of course, the core electrons, which is where the majority of shielding is happening. Let's work a quick practice problem where we apply this idea of the trends in atomic radius. And this is a common type of problem you'll see in periodic trend units. We're asked to order the following elements from smallest to largest atomic radius, germanium, fluorovium, bromine, and krypton. And in working problems like this, as we've done many, many times before, I like to draw a picture. And to draw a picture for this, I'm going to draw a chunk of the periodic table. Of course, you can also just look at a periodic table if you have that in front of you. And I would encourage you strongly to do that when you're working problems like this. Have a periodic table sitting in front of you for easy access. There's no need to memorize the positions of these elements on the periodic table. I'm a professional chemist, and I don't have these positions memorized. So let's lay down the elements we're interested in here on this hypothetical chunk of the periodic table. Krypton is in the upper right, element 36. Bromine is right next to it, element 35. Germanium is a bit further to the left in the same period, element 32. And fluorovium is in the same group as germanium, but way down at element 114. Now that we've laid this down, we need to get a sense of what the periodic trends in atomic radius are so that we can understand how these radii vary in a systematic way. And there are two trends to look at here, 
left to right across the period, we know that the radius decreases. Here I'm representing the radius as r. And moving down the group, r increases. Now, how do we take these trends and translate them into these elements? Well, let's think about this logically. r increases moving down and decreases moving to the right. This means that fluorovium must be the largest element in this series, since from fluorovium to germanium, the radius will decrease moving up, and germanium is bigger than bromine and krypton, since R decreases moving left to right across the periodic table. So fluorovium will be our largest element, followed by germanium. Bromine will be next, since R decreases as I move from germanium to bromine. And then krypton should be the smallest element in this series. So the correct ordering is krypton is the smallest, followed by bromine, followed by germanium, and finally, fluorovium is the largest. What about the radii of monatomic ions? Do those follow the same trends as atomic radii? The answer actually is yes, and we'll get there in a second, but before we get there, I want to talk about an important point about the sizes of cations and anions relative to the corresponding neutral atoms. Cations have lost electrons relative to the neutral atom, so they have a smaller radius than the corresponding neutral atom. So Al3+, for example, is much, much smaller than a neutral aluminum atom. On the other side, anions, because they've gained electrons, are much larger than the corresponding neutral atoms. So S2- minus is much larger than sulfur because it has two more electrons. Those electrons repel one another, and the entire collection of electrons tends to take up more space. A helpful concept for understanding the sizes of ions is this, is this idea of isoelectronic atoms or ions. They have identical electron configurations, and we alluded to this in writing electron configurations of ions that we can move to the left or right on the periodic table depending on whether we've lost or gained electrons respectively, and look at the electron configuration of that neutral element to write the configuration of an ion. The relative sizes of isoelectronic atoms or ions are determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. The more protons, the stronger the attraction to the nucleus, the smaller the atom or ion. It's a key idea in thinking about the relative sizes of isoelectronic atoms or ions. So ionic radii are going to depend on the charge in the way we just saw in the last slide, but also on Z effective. For, so moving down a group, ionic radius increases just like atomic radius, more layers to the onion for the exact same reason. When we look left to right, we have to be careful about charge, keeping in mind that charge will increase in magnitude as we move to the right, starting from group one to group two to group 13, looking only at the main group here. So size will decrease due to the increasing charge. And then when we get to group 16, for example, we're onto anions, and so charge will decrease in magnitude, moving left to right, O2 minus F minus, and actually the trend here is consistent with the trend in cation radii, it decreases moving left to right. However, I would encourage you to think differently about the anions and cations since there's a big difference here in the relative radii. You can see that the red cations are much, much smaller in general across the board than the blue anions. And so when we flip from cations to anions, there's a huge increase in ionic radius.